So our first speaker is a keynote is the keynote speaker. Um, there won't be a Q and A session, but he does have a session later to um, if you want to ask questions. Um, it's Alan Mustard who is the um, he's the chair of the OpenStreetMap Foundation, and he's been talking to a lot of people over the last year, um, virtually and in person. So he's got a lot of insight into OpenStreetMap, where it's come from, and what's changing. Um, so we're going to hear from Alan on winds of change. Um, I believe my technical team will. Since being elected first to the OSM Foundation Board of Directors and then Chairman of the Board last September, I spent a great deal of time on the telephone, Skype, and various conferencing apps listening to members of the OSM community, going all the way back to Steve Coast and forward through a mix of old-timers, heavy mappers, software developers, working group members, local chapters and communities, and advisory board members. I also kicked off a SWOT analysis on the OSM Wiki, a survey of strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, to hear from the broad OSM community what it thinks about the state of OSM. I'd like to share with you some conclusions I have drawn from these conversations and the SWOT analysis. I want to underscore that what you are about to hear is my own assessment based on 32 years of management experience, 20 of them in senior leadership roles. This assessment does not necessarily reflect either official OSM Foundation policy or the views of the board or any other of its members. The OSM Foundation is responsible for supporting but not controlling OpenStreetMap, raises funds, and generally creates an operating environment that allows mappers to map and data users to use the data. The board does not tell anybody what to map or how to map. The content of the OSM database is up to the mappers themselves and the local communities made up of those mappers. The data working group ensures that data conform to our copyright rules and helps the community enforce its other rules as to what the map database and its associated wiki should contain. The Foundation's mission statement lists several responsibilities the board carries, and among them is this, the OSF, OSMF board and board members define a strategic vision. That vision has clearly been lacking for the last few years, in part because of dissension on previous boards, and in part because of dissension among members of both the Foundation and the OSM community some of whom have historically objected to the notion that the board should make any decisions. The idea of the foundation board making decisions has been condemned as not the OSM way, and in some corners of the community, the view continues to be advanced that all decisions should be made collectively. This has led to paralysis, and thus many needed decisions were not made. In my conversations with community members since the start of the new year, only one person has insisted that the board should continue not making decisions. All others have expressed fatigue with the paralysis and suggested to me that it is time for the board to start making decisions that do not affect how anyone maps, but which will ensure the health and stability of our infrastructure and will protect the community's intellectual property. And make no mistake about that last point. Our intellectual property is valuable. It's now used by Apple, which combines it with data from TomTom Tom for Apple Maps. In 2010, or excuse me, 2019, Facebook switched 100% to OSM data, not because it is free, but because it is the highest quality global cartographic data set available. The user base is enormous and ranges from big corporations to a very long tail of small users. At one end, Microsoft's Bing uses OSM data, and so does ESRI. And then there's the humanitarian angle, exemplified by HOT, the humanitarian OSM team, which over the last 10 years has saved lives by creating maps needed by rescuers and medical personnel, all with OSM data. But that's only part of the picture. It's not just the big guys using OSM. It's thousands of map creators everywhere for whom OSM is crucial, and millions of users of the maps that they create, from small companies like Maps with Me to individual cartographers from Maribor to Manila, from Krakow to Cape Town. A map of the world that anyone can use has spawned an ecosystem of commercial and humanitarian organizations that don't merely use our data. They need it. They live by it. Between the SWOT analysis and the many conversations with stakeholders in the OSM community, I have identified a set of opposing viewpoints that, in their extreme forms, cannot be reconciled. This means that, ultimately, 
The community will have to make some decisions about which way to go in terms of a strategic vision or direction. This slide shows perhaps the most obvious of the opposing viewpoints I've heard or read, with traditional OSM views shown in red and advocacy for change shown in blue. Who is supposed to arbitrate between these two sets of opposing viewpoints? This arbitration is the board's responsibility, and as a board member, I have a fiduciary responsibility to our foundation and through it to its members to protect the OSM community's interests. That means that I, as a board member, must pull the community and through that process must discern what decisions the majority of the community supports. By law, I really do not have a choice. The board has to make decisions. But the decisions we as board members make must reflect what the community wants OSM to look like. There's a very simple reason for this. Without the community, there is no OSM, and a board that diverges from the community will endanger OSM's future. OSM is the community, and our map depends solely on the contributions of data from that community. I will not lead you through my analysis of the SWOT here, simply because I cannot do that in the time allotted. You'll have to visit the wiki and read the SWOT for yourself. If you want to read my analysis of the SWOT, send me an email and I'll send it to you. However, I would like to lead you through some highlights drawn from both the SWOT analysis and my more than 40 conversations with representatives of various factions within the OSM community. The Cognoscenti widely recognize that demand for OSM services, including tiles, geocoding, and geodata, has outstripped the current configuration of hardware and software and is straining the volunteer labor force, particularly the sysadmins. According to the Operations Working Group, this demand is growing at an astounding rate, 50% year-on-year. Our current configuration of hardware, software, and human beings operating and maintaining the hardware and software is not sustainable. Something has to give. Either the system will implode at some point, or the OSMF will take action to ensure that the platform remains reliable. This is the rub. Those who are screaming that the OSMF board should not make decisions seem not to recognize that the world has changed and the demand for OSM data is straining the system to the breaking point. The Cognoscenti also widely recognize that the operations working group has collapsed, which they see as symptomatic of the increased demands placed on the hitherto 100% volunteer duocracy. Though not universally held, the view that OSMF should begin to hire staff to augment the volunteer labor, particularly sysadmins and a software developer to maintain the API, is wide widespread. Notably, individuals responsible for maintaining OSM infrastructure specifically expressed that sentiment. Interestingly enough, resistance to this notion appears to come from people not involved in operations or maintenance of infrastructure. Multiple old-timers made comments to the effect that, quote, nobody envisioned OSM's success, unquote. Or as one of them put it, OSM shouldn't have worked, but somehow it did, with lots of time, effort, emotion, and pride. One respondent commented that OSM provides maps to 2 billion users per day, yet has only two sysadmins to maintain the hardware. Several remarked that OSM has outgrown the model of duocracy that carried it this far, and opined that it needs a new management model. One respondent highlighted the disconnect between casual mapping and the size of the project as it is today, and noted that having grown from a smaller project and not especially geographically diverse, OSM today requires greater commitment. Another said, more structure and more governance is required just because it's used more extensively. Put another way, a respondent said, growth and success have led it past the type of individuals who started it. Countering that, one respondent commented, the catch-22 of OSM is that actual mappers want a smaller OSMF and don't want dependence on outside money. One respondent perhaps captured this dilemma best. Superorganization isn't necessary, but anarchy is not an answer either. The conversations revealed a desire for better communications between the board and the community's various tribes, including working groups, which can only be satiated by making the effort to reach out, to schedule calls, and then just a call. Local communities and chapters in particular would like better communication with the board. Geographic coverage of the current outreach effort remains a work in progress. That said, I must point out that the board has begun reaching out to local communities, and perhaps more important, has begun working harder to process local chapter applications more quickly than before. The board is also inviting a local chapter each month to brief us 
at the end of each board meeting. Surprisingly, a desire for vector tiles came up 12 times in conversations tying for second place with community outreach. Some respondents merely see in vector tiles a sign of progress, that OSM is keeping up with Google, but others see in them a solution to desires, such as multilingual standard maps. While the tech wizards asserted that OSMF hardware is adequate to host vector tiles, at least initially, surprisingly, not one respondent could quote a solid cost estimate for shifting from raster to vector tiles, nor could any respondent describe in brief a course of action needed to carry out such a shift. Time estimates range from a couple of weekends to six to eight weeks. One major issue appears to be who would control the style sheets that determine which vector maps are displayed, and some users in the commercial sphere expressed concerns that OSMF's sponsored vector tiles would compete with their paid services. In short, though there is a strong indication that vector tiles are desirable, there is a lack of consensus either as to how much would be too much and how much it would cost. One respondent noted that there is nothing to stop local chapters or others from hosting vector tiles if they wanted to and suggested urging local communities and chapters to experiment with vector tiles before the OSMF decides on a solution should it decide to do so. Respondents widely view the board as having failed to take responsibility for issues that have arisen. One respondent asserted that the board has taken exactly one significant decision since 2010, the change of license to ODBL. One consequence of this is that third parties unaccountable to the community at large have filled some vacuums. The board's conscious decision to take a hands-off approach to development of the ID editor in particular is a flashpoint in this regard. While some welcome development of a user-friendly intuitive editor, even if by a third party not under community influence, ID's tagging precepts have raised concerns about perceived lack of community input into development decisions. As one respondent put it, Key technology should be OSMF's responsibility. This is why the board has undertaken an effort to establish a software governance model for ID that will allow community input on controversial aspects of ID development to surface and to be taken into account without stifling the innovations that have made ID such a fantastic editor. And yes, I'm showing my bias here. I use ID. I use it a lot, and I absolutely love it. Another respondent viewed this abdication of responsibility as a prelude to long-term death of the OSM community, as it paves the way for a backdoor corporate takeover of OSM. Another respondent said bluntly that board weakness creates a power dynamic with outsiders who can pay workers and then control it. One respondent noted, there is room for the board to be more assertive because of the threats out there, the need to meet threats and challenges. Volunteers cannot do it themselves. Were the board to begin making substantive decisions in the opinion of some respondents, another weakness would quickly become apparent. As one put it, the board has no real ability to put contracts in place to implement decisions. The board, this person said, must either build capacity or let outsiders do it. Another issue is the board's failure to enforce its policies, such as tile use policy, which has led directly to a massive overload of OSM's tile servers which according to the operations working group at peak loads respond to nearly 400,000 tile calls per second. Respondents raised protection of the trademark a few times and thought that previous boards had neglected it. Additional issues include failure to pursue community development, a bias in favor of European points of view, and failure to demand attribution for use of OSM data. However, two prominent computer community members asserted that board inaction is quote, the OSM way, unquote, and indicated a desire to see the OSMF board as a figurehead, existing solely to fulfill requirements of the Companies Act 2006 and nothing more. As one put it, the board is to do the minimum necessary to keep OSM running. Another expressed fear that a future board could, quote, go in a bad direction, unquote, and thus the precedent of the board's making decisions could bode ill. The community will need to reconcile this divergence in attitudes one way or the other. Shifting to the diversity question, communities outside Western Europe generally welcomed the board's recent adoption of a diversity statement and formation of the Diversity and Inclusion Special Committee. One community went so far as to say it was long overdue, but still is not enough because local communities avoid speaking up out of fear of very vocal and hostile community members in other geographic areas shouting them down. One respondent said bluntly that the Diversity and Inclusion Special Committee, quote, needs a space for discussions without being attacked, unquote, 
incited a tendency to intimidate on the part of other community members. In that regard, multiple respondents called for a code of conduct of some sort to moderate dialogues and reduce the fear of hostile responses. Respondents in Africa and Asia underscored the cost of volunteering, noting that in lower income countries, the cost of internet access and the need to work more than one job to support a family constrains time devoted to volunteer mapping. This is an obstacle to geographic diversity. Respondents see the fee waiver program for foundation membership positively in theory, but in many minds its impact remains to be seen. Data users were surprisingly supportive of diversity because they see it as a source of data quality. As one respondent put it, quote, mapping is somewhat subjective, unquote. So diverse mappers generate more diverse, that is, more complete, data than does a white male dominated mapping community. Many respondents complained of special interests steering or dominating issues to the detriment of the broader interests of the OSM community. As one of them put it, if you let the loudmouths direct strategy, nothing will happen. Another put it slightly differently, use of the project is imperiled by a few loud voices. On the other hand, one respondent in Europe criticized the board for focusing on political correctness by publishing the diversity policy and forming the special committee. The sixth most raised issue revolved around artificial intelligence and machine learning, with those in favor of incorporating them under human approval processes represented in Asia, Africa, and among the corporate members sponsoring those technologies. Opposition to artificial intelligence and machine learning seems to be concentrated in Western Europe, where it is viewed as of little utility. Support is found in geographic locales facing daunting obstacles, high internet costs, low internet penetration, and low volunteerism, the latter two often rooted in economic circumstances. As one respondent put it bluntly, our country is vast and we don't have enough volunteers to map all the roads and waterways by hand. Mappers in such circumstances appear to welcome AI tools as a way of increasing craft mapper productivity. Interestingly, the corporate members underscored the critical importance of local knowledge, for as one put it, AI can draw a road but only a local mapper can name it. And you and I might add, certify that it's a road and not something else. Another non-corporate respondent noted, a growing proportion of data cannot be collected by armchair mapping. We need on-the-ground knowledge. Corporate users who professed keen interest in improved data quality highlighted the role of AI in rapidly detecting vandalism so that the data working group and local mappers can react quickly. While application of AI and machine learning is not a board issue, strictly speaking, but rather one squarely in the laps of the local communities, each to decide within the framework of organized mapping guidelines, its importance to certain local communities was striking. As I start to wrap up this presentation, I want to share some quotes that seem to strike a middle ground between the two extremes I showed you earlier. The last quote hit me right between the eyes. In researching the work of past boards and the low level of decision making for the past decade, it became apparent that in many cases the board shied away from making decisions that were expected to attract vocal criticism, even if the number of critical voices itself was small. Just like there's no healthy democracy without a free press, critical voices have their place in a healthy community. While some might suspect such voices to simply seek to impose their own views, they can also have their fingers on the pulse of the community. But the expectation of criticism, even fierce criticism, should not lead to a failure to make decisions on the part of the board, as long as those decisions reflect the interests of the community as a whole and, what's critically important, of the OSM project more generally. Anarchy is not healthy for any organization, and it is my firm opinion that the elected board of directors of the OSM Foundation must make decisions that will ensure the continued health and stability, indeed, the very future of the OSM movement, all the while not telling anybody what to map or how to map. These are the core values of OSM as posted on the OSM Foundation's wiki. I invite you to read them now, and I have a request. Translate them into your native language if it isn't English, and post them on the OSM wiki. If we bear them firmly in mind, we can more easily come to agreement on the decisions the community and the board are going to have to make over the next year, the next two years, the next decade. We want to make the best map data set of the world. We want the data to be available under a free and open license to everybody. We want it to be powered by its community. 
We want the data to be used as widely as possible. We favor objective ground truth over all other sources. And we want for you to map the things that you care about. And we want to be able to ensure that you have the freedom to do so. Based on the core values, these are examples of the types of questions the board needs to ask the community, in my opinion. If we're going to live up to our core values, the board needs answers. In most cases, however, the board will leave the answers to the local chapters and communities. To the degree possible, I agree that OSM should govern itself and that local communities and the volunteer working group should decide what works best for them and for the project. But when it comes to existential issues, such as maintenance of infrastructure, such as expanding OSM into spaces where it is not, such as protecting our intellectual property, the board must act if it is to live up to its responsibilities. Demand for OSM data is growing 50% year on year. We need more money to ensure stability of our platform. Where will the money come from? What risks do we face and how do we guard OSM against them? Do we need to invest in a project to render vector tiles, for example? Should we even do that? Or should we leave it to someone else, to a local chapter or to a third party? If we should do that, should we limit access so we don't compete with commercial providers in the ecosystem? The community is divided on these questions, so the duly elected board has to decide based on a combination of community input and the board's own assessment of what is in OSM's best interests, not merely for survival, but in order to thrive into the next decade. I encourage you to make your voice heard. Join the OSM Foundation. You can do it online. Once a member, then join the OSM Talk mailing list and start sharing your expertise and ideas for making OSM better and better for everyone. I thank you for your attention. Okay, so um, that was the keynote from Alan Mustard. Um, and I see you've been putting stuff in the, um, the Q&A there. Um, so Alan, uh, as keynote, isn't there isn't a Q&A session, but he does have a self-organized session um, that's at 7 p.m., 1900 hours. So you can go to the website, look at the self-organized sessions there and join him, he's doing a Q&A um, as chair of the board, which that talk kind of pushed some big questions on there. Um, you'll get to see him face to face and that will be a live kind of chat. Um, we'll make sure he can see those questions um, so that he can maybe answer some of them there. But I think he's opening up to any questions um, that you might have. Um, also on that talk, it talked a lot about the history about OpenStreetMap and the project. Um, you might be interested that at uh, 5.15 this evening, so 17.15, Frederick Ram's talking about um, misunderstandings uh, in the history of OSM that I think might bring some context to some of the things um, or add on to some of the things that Frederick talked about in that talk. Um, now, this is track one of State of the Map 2020. Um, track two is about to start. I think they're just trying to work out some technical difficulties, um, but there's about two minutes there until that starts. Um, and yep, you've got your questions there. So, and as I said, we're talking on social media. Um, there's Twitter, the hashtag Sotom um, 2020. There's the Telegram group. We're using the old one, um, SOTM 2018, because lots of people are there. Um, and there's IRC as well. Um, so I think we are um, just about ready to start our next talk. So there will be a Q&A after this. Um, but this is Leet Lunas. Um, she's talking about uh what she's doing what she's been doing with drones um the various uses of them um and some desires to do more 
Um, so make sure you ask any questions in the session pad that you have for her. Um, and we'll start that talk about now.